this is a webinar that we have been trying to put together now. We've been planning this probably for the last six months with the Global Emergency Medicine Fellowships Consortium. So thanks to SAM for helping us to host this. So thanks so much for being here. The Global Emergency Medicine Fellowship Consortium has been trying to organize this for the past six months to really try to explore what lifestyle looks like from a global emergency medicine and global health perspective. This is hosted by SAM and GEMFC. So thank you all so much for coming. We have an amazing panel of very inspirational practitioners who are all practicing global health and global emergency medicine in some sort of way. So for those of us who work globally, it's quite a challenge. Most of us are clinicians to start with, and that's our primary role. But then we're also, some of us are running fellowships. Some of us are helping to teach medical students. A few of us are involved in residency education directly or admin. Some of us are doing research. And how do you blend all of those different roles and also have a life at the same time and then stay sane? So that's what we're really sort of hoping to explore explore and talk about during this webinar. The panelists that we have, we have physicians in academia, we have physicians in who are in community practice for you today, panelists who are wives, who are husbands, who are parents, who are dog parents, who some of us are working in low resource settings and are traveling there from the U.S. And some of us are living directly in a low or middle income setting. And we have some questions to pose to our panelists to kind of get the conversation started. But if at any time you have a question for one of us individually, or you want to just pose a conversation point to the group, please feel free to, to put it in the chat. Dr. Adeline is going to be helping us to scan the chat to make sure that we can ask your question in real time because we really it's it's hard on this sort of webinar format but we really would like this to be an interactive panel um, and to have your input for our panelists so with that here are our panelists that we have today we have dr brian valentine who is here dr carly brady dr kristen Dottori, dr monica don dr ben linquist and dr lacy minkin smith so we're going to get started we're going to let each panelist sort of introduce themselves and tell us what their personal life looks like now and where are they now? So we're just going to go in alphabetical order. So Brian, if you want to go ahead and start with you. Well, uh, good morning or good afternoon, whatever time zone you might be in. So Dr. Koval, thank you for the opportunity to be here. So I'm currently a regional medical director for Team Health. I have also been working with sound physicians as well. I'm a community physician, never been academic formally, but really through various organizations have had the opportunity to make roughly probably 20 trips. Most of these are annual and all short term to various parts of the globe. So thank you for the opportunity to talk. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what your what your personal life looks like from who's at home when you go home in the evening? So in the top right picture is my wife. She's in the front. And then leading behind that, there are four children. And then there's a teenage daughter who's hiding appropriately beyond my youngest son. So anyone who are teenagers, you can probably recognize that. So my wife, we've been married for 23 years. So we have four children at home. They're now aged nine to 16 years. And she's really the, the glue that kind of helps hold all this together, especially when I do have the opportunity to travel. And we'll kind of go across the board on this if this will generate questions for later. I'm actually going to leave this coming Friday to go back to Ukraine. My top left corner, it's an organization called New Horizons for Children. And we do well child checks on orphans. And we visit a different orphanage every day. It's just very, very much, you know, primary care. I'm emergency medicine trained. I'm not practicing emergency medicine there. But it's a really, really neat opportunity to serve. A lot of the kids there are shuttled over from the east and the south where all the fighting is to this relatively safer area there in the west. And the city is called Lviv, L-V-I-V, but New Horizons for Children. Bottom left is opportunity to serve in Iraq. It's kind of a mixed educational piece and a refugee free medical camp, a free medical camp as well. They actually have an EM residency program in Erbil. It's kind of in the northern third in the Kurdish portion. And they have a residency program there. And so we would, we went there, we've probably been there five times. Each time we go, we'll do like a two-day educational course. This is an ultrasound course. We went back another time. We did ACLS and PALS teaching now, as many of you know, all those are branded by the American Heart Association it will not allow you to do that domestically, I mean, internationally. So so what we did is we found a, kind of a, a knockoff organization, so to speak, that would say, hey, we're, we're more than happy to kind of to kind of certify them. But again, it's not American Heart Association, but 
but it, it's all the same information. We've gone through this course multiple times, and it was actually free to them as well. Uh, obviously, we didn't charge. We paid our own way to go for all these trips, but but they did not incur a fee. And that's a that's another Iraq picture in the middle from a village, and then the bottom right is Brazil. Awesome. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Dr. Brady, Dr. Brady, if you can hear us, you are muted. So she is physically in Malawi, and I know she was um, a little bit worried about um, being a potential issue. So we'll come back to you, Dr. Brady. Kristen. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kristen DeTorey. I am on faculty at Vanderbilt in Nashville, Tennessee. I did my residency here and then stayed on as the first guinea pig global EM fellow and have just stuck around. I've been here for 18 years, so I'm kind of old at this point. Um, I'm currently the global health or global EM fellowship director. And I realize I put a lot of life pictures and not as much work pictures on here, but I have an academic position and a hybrid position at one of our community sites as well. I have worked in Georgetown, Guyana, basically since residency. So for at least 15 years, I also do other work when it's needed or wanted. A lot of people know I'm pretty willing to go anywhere, but I have a longstanding partnership in Guyana and I also work in Honduras. My life at home, I am married. We have a dog and two cats, no kiddos. My husband is a professional musician and most people think that's like really cool and he probably sings and plays guitar, but he actually plays trombone and he teaches music to kids and also plays a lot of shows, mostly salsa shows. So it's really fun. We love to hike and be outside and be at the lake and also travel. And one of those pictures is with Lacey, who we've met through our global work. We've never worked at the same site in the United States, but we have become really good friends from our global work. Awesome. Thank you, Kristen. Hey, my name is Monica Dant. I am an internal medicine physician, a hospitalist, which is just kind of a fancy word that we came up with for someone who only works in the hospital. I'm an academic hospitalist, so I work at Tulane University in New Orleans, where I've been for about 17 years now. I did my residency here, did a chief residency here, and then since then I have worked for NGOs off and on. I work mostly for Doctors Without Borders. I just joined the board of Doctors Without Borders last year also, but I've worked for other NGOs as well, including Doctors for Global Health. I'm also on their board and then a few other smaller NGOs. So the way my life looks right now is that I have this academic position. So I'm teaching residents, medical students, all of that at University Medical Center, which is kind of like the public hospital hospital in New Orleans. I do that for six months out of the year. And the other six months, I'm usually on a mission with MSF or another NGO. I'm not married. I don't have any kids or pets. And that is by choice because I'm usually moving around quite a lot. So it's been a little bit easier for me to manage that versus some people who, you know, have, have the family life. Life. But yeah, those pictures are from both from Peru, I believe. Yeah, they're both from Peru, where I was with MSF at the end of COVID. So when the vaccination campaign came out, we were doing mass vaccination campaigns in Arequipa and then also running a high flow oxygen unit at altitude near Cusco, which many of you have probably been to. It's also a very beautiful place to visit as a tourist. And I'm happy to answer any questions that y'all have about that. Thank you, Dr. Don. Dr. Lindquist. All right. Well, thanks for having me, Dr. Koval. So I currently work at Stanford. I did my residency and fellowship in global emergency medicine here. And I had the opportunity a few years ago to take over and help direct the fellowship. Currently at home, I have a wife. I'm married. I have three children, six and under. So a lot of my time currently is spent at home chasing them around. So you can see our Halloween photos there. I also was a co-fellow with Katie. So we've known each other for quite some time. And that bottom photo is from some of the work we've done in India. Yeah, so. I the bottom left my view I guess is some time I just spent in Kenya and a lot of the work I've done predominantly has been with pre-hospital care so really passionate about improving capacity and access to quality emergency care so very nice to be on this panel thank you so much and Dr. Minkin Hi there. I'm going to try and turn my video on. It keeps slowing down when I have it on. My name is Lacey Menken-Smith, and my career path in Global EM started very much in academics. So I did uh, my residency and my fellowship at the Medical University of South Carolina and sort of took over running the fellowship program there. Worked a lot primarily in Guyana, Uganda, and Haiti. And so that's how I got to know Kristen was through my work in Guyana. And then very recently in the last three years kind of transitioned. So I'm currently living and working full-time in St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And so I work at a critical access hospital here on the island. It's a really great opportunity to kind of do a combination of global health work for an underserved 
population outside of the mainland United States that still be living and working in a U.S. territory. And so I am married. My husband, Tony's in that photo with me, horseback riding. We live here with our two giant dogs, but don't have any children. And then in that bottom photo, that's me with some of the, the residents in Guyana. Got a photo of me scuba diving here on St. Croix. And then also a lot of my work is with the One World Health NGO uh, at the Masindi Katara Hospital in Uganda. And so that bottom photo is doing a, a training for nurses in emergency care. And then I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Koval, who is mediating the panel, and she has taken over the fellowship at MUSC and, and doing a fantastic job with it. And so I'm lucky that I get to do kind of like a hybrid academic position, even though I'm living and working here in, in community medicine, because I still stay on board with MUSC's global health program. And so get to do a lot of research and quality improvement projects. And so I still spend a couple weeks out of every year, either in Uganda or Guyana or both of them. Awesome. Thanks, Lacey. And I just wanted to circle back and see if Dr. Brady has any better connection that she might be able to introduce herself. Hi. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. So thanks to everybody for going with the flow. I was always having a little bit of connectivity problems there. As was mentioned, I actually am currently in Blantyre, Malawi, which is where I live and work. So my I did my emergency medicine residency training in Columbia, South Carolina, and then I continued on and did my fellowship there as well in global health. And then kind of at the tail end of my fellowship, rather than doing a bunch of short-term trips, I actually packed up my family with my husband and we moved here to Blantyre, Malawi, where I had done a little Bit of, done a little bit of work looking beforehand and determined that emergency medicine had already been identified as a priority within this community. And so it wasn't going to be something that I was going to be, you know, developing myself, but rather I was going to be putting a shoulder behind something that the local Malawians had already identified as something that, that they wanted to progress. And so here, my official title is a lecturer in emergency medicine because my actual employer, after I spent some, some time in volunteering, I actually was able able to get a job with the College of Medicine, which is what all of the medical students as well as all of the registrars or MMed candidates, which is what we which is what we would call residents, are kind of housed under. We've started the first emergency medicine residency program here. And so yeah, that's I spend a lot of time trying to find that balance between the never ending clinical work that there is in these settings and then also trying to to build into something lasting that'll that'll be here long after I'm gone. So for the pictures on the, we'll start with my family who came. So when I actually originally came, I, it was just me and my husband and then our oldest, Ellie, who's obviously the oldest in the picture. And then since we've been here, Miriam, the middle one, and, and Ezekiel have joined us. It's a picture of us hiking Mount Mulanji, which is a really great mountain that if any of you guys find yourself in Malawi, you should come and hike with us. Pretty typical picture of, you know, mountain biking with zebras because I thought people would think that was cool. Um, I get to have interesting things like that in my life. And then I don't actually have any pictures of me working because this is just actually my job and how many of us really take pictures of us just taking care of patients at our job. But what I did give is a photo of a ultrasound training course that we did. So I am still partnered with the, the program that actually I did my training at, which is now called Prisma Health Emergency Medicine. And so the, there, we have an MOU with them. And this is a part of a ultrasound training or ultrasound based, sorry, ultrasound guide procedures training course that we did and with these really cool 3D printed models. And so I've been really, really fortunate to be able to continue to have those relationships that were really critical in forming me, but have continued even while I was here. Curly, how long have you been in Malawi and how long do you think you'll be staying? We have been here since 2019. So five years now, and I guess until I get the work done. Amazing. So I think we were just going to sort of go in a round robin with some of these next Next questions. And if anyone wants to sort of, you know, jump in, we can just do it that way, I think. But the first question we wanted to pose to you guys, and I just sort of try to put a clause here to sort of think about the different facets and type of, of global emergency medicine and, and global health in general, since not all of us are emergency medicine, but just to, to give everyone a little bit of an idea of how much time you are spending abroad annually and sort of how you get that time off from your employer. Hey, I'll start. This is Monica Dunn. So I'm the, I'm the hospitalist here, internal medicine, I think everyone else is so perhaps a little bit of a different setup, but I have an academic position that is full-time for part of the year, which is a 
little bit unusual. I work at Tulane University and there is there was a precedent set when I started my residency there. There were a lot of other people that had worked for MSF, Doctors Without Borders, and had done a lot of international work. And the way that they had negotiated it initially was to have two people share a full-time academic position. So basically you're putting all of your however many weeks you want to do in the year into a six-month period if that's if that's how you choose to do it. And then the other person takes over for the other six months of the year. Since I don't have a clinic, I don't have to worry about that. And you know, I became a hospitalist on purpose. I'm not interested in having kind of commitments in the United States year round. So similar to emergency medicine, you can kind of just see your patients and then you go home and you don't really have that that same responsibility that a family practice physician might have. So I negotiated that same thing, except I didn't have another person to take over the other the other half of the year, but they just kind of let me do it. I think part of the, I guess my advice would be, you know, for, for me when I went in, the first time I asked, they did tell me no. And the second time I, I asked was the year after and I was prepared to to leave the job if they if they didn't you know accept my my request. So I, I would say know your bottom line. For me, that was my bottom line, and I knew that I could find a locum's job somewhere else. But I really preferred to stay within academic medicine because I really like the teaching side of it. So that was one thing. And the other thing was because I did my residency at Tulane, I was a known entity. I wasn't just a random person coming in. There was already a precedent set. Those people could vouch for me. I had already worked as a chief resident, so all of that certainly played a role. I think it would have been difficult to go to another academic center and say, hey, I will work for you for half of the year. Maybe other people have similar setups. I actually haven't met anyone else besides at Tulane who has those setups as an internist. But that's what I do now. So I, I do, uh, I've done it different ways. Currently, I do six months of the year internationally and six months um, in the United States. And I will say after having done that for quite some time now, it is a little bit tiring. So I'm kind of trying to figure out what my next moves are. So I'm interested to hear what other people do because you can always learn from your colleagues. So I hope to get advice here myself. How long are your deployments? with MSF? So they now they're six months or up to six months. So this, this past year, I did a really short one with a different NGO. I did three months. Now that I have other responsibilities, so I think I mentioned I'm now on two boards, including the MSF board. And because of that, I have a restriction in the number of months I can be away just because then I'd be missing too many kind of board meetings and things like that. So now I can only go for three months of the year. So yeah, you know, I'm kind of in that transition. I've been, I, I graduated my residency in 2012 and I've been doing this for quite some time now. So I'm kind of shifting into something else and we will stay tuned to find out what what that is i'm also curious to find out what it is but but yes generally between now three months six months and i've done even longer ones before the first year that i was away i just quit my job entirely and and spent i think nine nine months nine to ten months out of the country for those who maybe aren't as familiar with msf do you have i know language is often like a high priority for many of the people or the positions that they employ and then do you have any say in sort of where you you get to go so a couple things there's actually another msf for on this call. I saw that. Um, perhaps you guys already know each other. But yes, I think there, there are language requirements. You should know another language. French has always been a priority. We do actually have fewer projects in French speaking African countries now than we ever have before. It doesn't mean that it's still not the majority, but other languages are more important now. So Spanish, for example, we have more projects in Spanish speaking countries that didn't used to be somewhere that we worked um, that intensely. Arabic is always useful. So those things are are important, but international experience is also important. Ability to handle stress also important. I remember my, my interview with MSF years ago was mostly talking about how I managed intensely stressful situations and very little about what my medical expertise was. So those were those were the big things. Was that your question about language? And I can't remember what the other part was. If you have a say in where you get to be deployed. Yeah. So generally, no, you should commit up to nine months for your first mission. That's always, you know, the standard. You should be able to commit nine months and you should be ready to accept wherever wherever they place you with the caveat that if you're concerned for your safety, you can always say no and you can always refuse any mission. But, you know, if you're if you have one place in particular that you want to go to, I mean, if that's not really how it works, you're usually being placed where the need is. Certainly as you get further up in your career and you have more specific skill set, you know, like I've worked in a lot of refugee camps, some conflict settings, outbreak settings. And so if those needs arise, I have a lot more experience than perhaps some other people. And I would be more likely to get that position if I wanted to work in you know, wherever that setting was. But generally, no, you should be able to commit nine months up front. You should have another language skill and you you generally don't refuse the mission unless you have a safety concern. Ben or Brian or Kristen, do you want to share sort of how you balance time in the U.S. versus time abroad and how that works with your 
I guess, chairman or, or boss? Yeah, I'm, I'll kind of kick that off and I'll, I'll try to be brief because we can allow time for the other panelists. Just coming back to the last question, I, I'm usually the one who organizes the trips. And so these are volunteer, we're paying our own way. So they're, they're usually short term because we have day jobs at home, right? To kind of pay the bills. And so the trips are usually no longer than two weeks. And I try to schedule them during months where there are less competition for requests, major holidays, other people want to go on ski trips. So, so it's usually kind of in the lower demand months. And, and I have the, have the trip spanning over two months. So this one coming up, I'm going back to Ukraine on Friday, and it will actually, you know, kind of bleed over into March. And so that doesn't doesn't kind of concentrate my clinical schedule so, so much on the front end and the back end. So in regards to family time, you know, my wife, she's a physical therapist. She's very supportive. We both have a faith and a higher and a power and feel like we have been blessed and we are we are called to share what would we have been blessed. And, and we feel like we have been served and therefore we should serve as well. And so She's very supportive of this. Pre-children, we went on trips together. She actually worked as a physical therapist and found some patients that she could help from the medical clinic. And so it's 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 good to have a very supporting partner. I can go next. I would say don't do what I did. And that was straight from fellowship. I We were not really getting protected time or any financial like extra to do any global work within our department. And so I decided to work three quarters time and get paid three quarters time to continue doing my global work. And so I did that for about a decade. And looking back on it, I realized the work we do is very valuable. And so it's worth negotiating from the start to and to find a job that does recognize that the work we're doing is valuable. So since I became a fellowship director through Vanderbilt, they do give you like nine hours of protected time each month. So I have like one less shift per month to be a fellowship director, which I use to do some of the Guyana work. But I don't get any any true protected time to work in Guyana. So I just have, I still work partial effort and have a partial salary and just dedicate my time to this ongoing project that I probably will never leave at this point. But I do think it's important early on to find a job. And this is kind of going later in the session, but to find a job that recognizes the work you do and the value in it and try to start with that and start by saying like, Hey, I really want to continue doing my global work. How can I benefit our department by doing that? And how can we work at this together? Because it's a lot if you don't get any protected time or buy down to do the work. How long are your trips when you're traveling to Guyana and Honduras and how many times do you get to travel for your? I can truly go as many times as I would like. I have a goal to be there every quarter. And so I usually have about a 10 day to two week trip every quarter. And then I teach and I do admin work on a weekly basis with our Guyanese colleagues. So there's a lot of time outside of being in the country that I'm spending working with them, but at least probably eight weeks on the ground throughout the year. And then every week is a, is some sort of admin or teaching. Yeah, sure. I can go. So prior to kids, I, you know, traveled more frequently and I had to kind of reevaluate and be more intentional with travel and kind of choose projects and teams where kind of a remote engagement was was an option and prioritized. I also have the benefit of working with a pretty large team, including three fellows. So have a have have the ability to have people from our team traveling quite often, even if I'm not going on on a majority of the trip. So I would say currently my current life stage, I'm doing one to two international trips a year. And that kind of the time, the timing and the length kind of varies depending on what the project is, but having, you know, similar to Kristen, having frequent, you know, administrative check-ins and meetings with our partners. So I have a current partnership with a group in, in Kenya, where we have kind of every week, every other week meetings. And, and so a lot of kind of longitudinal work without the kind of frequent or long trips that I might have done earlier in my career, but I also have a, a team of, of folks who are who are traveling and more flexible with their schedules. I'm not sure if there right. was part of that question. No, so. no, that's no, that's it. That's right. Yeah, that's it. I was just seeing if anyone else had any closing thoughts on that piece, but we will we will move to a, a sensitive topic of financial support for your work. 
and how you have been successful in negotiating that. I think that's always an area that I know I always look for advice in that realm also, but would love to hear sort of how you are funded for your time abroad. If you are, it sounds like Kristen, you mentioned that you are not funded for the direct time that you are on the ground, but get some support from the fellowship. Ben, I imagine your situation is similar. Are you being paid for the time that, that you are traveling when you're going to Kenya for those trips? Yeah, I'd say it kind of depends. Some trips have been funded, some exploratory trips early on in a, you know, in a relationship have been unfunded or funded from, you know, departmental enrichment funds or CME funds or whatever, you know, private extra educational funds we might have. Current project is funded. And then there's some funding for my time as well, but that certainly doesn't always happen. I think our department has I imagine a similar process to identify the amount of shifts that everybody has to do depending on their job requirements or roles within the department. So we kind of have a tiered system. And so things like fellowship director, you know, medical director, other things go into this system where they kind of come out with a magic number of how many shifts you owe a month. And then we do have a large group. So we have quite a bit of flexibility as far as, you know, taking shifts, you know, during, during the month and where to put those and that kind of thing. But there is some financial buy down or incentive for certain roles and certainly administrative or director roles get some of that. But a lot of the other things, you know, actually doing the educational work or being abroad certainly doesn't get funded from the department, but we do, you know, apply for a lot of seed grants and other funding and or create MOUs with some of these other groups abroad to try and provide some you know funding for our time as well as for the travel. And Brian, you said that the trips that you do, the two weeks is all of that is sort of volunteer work and there's not a compensation or anything from the community side. Is that right? Yes, correct. And, and you know, before I finished residency, I don't know if it was during residency or not, but at least be- before I finished residency, if I had the opportunity to go on a trip, I would send out 50 letters and I would receive sponsorships to go. It would always be through a nonprofit organization. So people would make their donation to the nonprofit and they would get the tax deductible benefit from there to try to maximize that piece of it. But since that time, you know, as we collective audience, we're, we're blessed with a physician salary, which is a little bit, you know, higher than the, than you know, the, the regular job, so to speak. And and as a result of that, my wife and I, we, she's very supportive. And so we, we save up over the course of the year. And then when that time comes, we will, we will give our money for the cost of the trip to the nonprofit and receive a tax benefit, but ultimately we end up saving for the trip. And like you said, all of our trips, and I'll make that very clear when I recruit people up front that, you know, this is strictly volunteer. You're going to need to come up with your own funds, but also I hand them sample letters for sponsorships. So they have the ability to send those out and gain sponsors, but email, text, snail mail, what have you. Monica and Carly and Lacey, do you want to share a little bit about your employer and how you are paid, I guess, you know, from your non-traditional, so Monica, you know, being paid from the MSF side and, and maybe Lacey and Carly, like sort of how you found that role in that position. Like if I decided I wanted to come, you know, join you in Malawi, Carly, would there be an opportunity for that? Something like that. I'll go ahead and I guess I'll go ahead and start recognizing that I'm kind of the most extreme example for a lot of things on here. So mine technically has sort of been a combination of three different things and how I I was able to finance four, really, I suppose. So as I mentioned, I actually initially came here as a global health fellow. And so, you know, I, I think this is probably a non-traditional approach to a fellowship, but I don't, I think this is probably the least weird part of my story, which is that, you know, during the fellowship, there was, there was always kind of a plan. There was built into the fellowship this expectation that there would be time abroad. And so essentially what I did when I did the fellowship was I just figured out exactly how many hours I needed to work during that first year so that I would satisfy all the hours requirements for the fellowship so that I could then just be able to be gone for the whole second part of the fellowship, essentially, which, like I said, is a bit non-traditional, but not really outside of the norms of probably what expectations are. I mean, you're still you know, do it fulfilling all of the obligations maybe that you have. I was fortunate to have the fellowship that is willing to let me do that. So of course that was something that kind of had to be agreed upon beforehand. I don't recommend, you know, just assuming that that's going to be possible, but I do think that that is something that was feasible. And so that was the first way that I was able to kind of get this blocked off this time. And so as a result of that, because I was on a fellow salary, I still had income coming in for that first year. And so for me, that was actually what allowed me to finish 
finish paying off my medical school loans just while I was while I was still here. And then as for my husband actually does work for an organization as well. It's called Young Life. And so that's been something that's been a very, a huge blessing for us just because that has meant that, you know, all of our medical insurance and things like that have actually been taken care of through Young Life. And so that has actually given me the ability to really just focus on, I guess, kind of what I'm trying to do as a physician and with my career here and not necessarily worry about exactly how we're going to provide for our family. Of note, there are sending organizations for doctors that do basically the same thing if if somebody does have interest that I could connect you with that would that have recognized that this is an issue, you know, for people maybe wanting to do something more like what I've done and, and go somewhere long term. After that, there was a season of just, I had heard that there was this position that, you know, because I, like I said, they'd already identified emergency medicine as a priority, but sometimes, particularly in countries like Malawi, things move slowly. And so there was about a year there of this job. It is going to exist. It's it's happening. We're going to make it. And so there was a period of time where I was really, really just here truly as a volunteer. I mean, technically I was here as a volunteer when I was a fellow, but I still had a title. And at that point I'd finished my fellowship time and I was really just here volunteering kind of with the hopes of, you know, this position being created and me being able to apply for it and actually having a formal position within the the College of Medicine, which is what they call it here. And then and then in, let's see, September of 2020, which let's all acknowledge that 2020 was just a ridiculous year for many reasons. But in September of 2020, we had successfully gone through the interviews and everything, which was quite funny because it's like, I'm applying for an interview. I mean, I'm interviewing for a position for an emergency physician, and I know there's no other one in the country. So it's just very funny that I was doing it, but I did. I jumped through the hoops, got and have the, now have the position as lecturer. And so I am employed by the College of Medicine. I will be honest that it is not, if you think it was a bad thing to calculate how much you make per hour in residency, you really don't want to do it if you're in a position like mine. But it has, it is still, you know, it is still a really good salary kind of compared to what a lot of people make here. And it has been enough to be able to kind of augment our income to be able to make up for those things that are not necessarily covered for by my the, the organization that my husband works with. And so because they have kind of a calculated amount that they would expect that we would need. And so then I do have additional costs and things that I have to that I incur, you know, from being a physician from having a medical license, we need a second vehicle to make it so that I can do what I need to do. And so it's really able to augment that so that we can we can do that. In addition, in order to help kind of with the need to travel back and forth to the US, generally, I have prioritized going back and working in the US about once a year, because if you followed that, then I pretty much finished residency, did fellowship and then moved to another country, which also is probably not something that I would recommend, although it is maybe the best way to make it happen before you get a bunch of other things in life that are going to stop you from doing it. But I did really feel like I needed to make sure that I continued to have that experience stateside so that I wouldn't be completely stupid when I come back and try to work with you guys. And so that does also allow us to have a little bit of extra income and is it what kind of what it helps us, you know, when we need to pay for flights for this growing family that we have here. So, so kind of that way you come back and you work in Columbia, South Carolina. I have, I've, I've worked in a couple different places. Like I said, there's that whole COVID part that went in there that actually confused. It was, so I've worked in Columbia and then I've also worked, I'm from West Virginia originally. And so there was a period. So when we, we actually came back for about a five month period during COVID. And this was actually during a time that, like I said, Palmetto Health was the name of the residency program when I was there. And it was Prisma Health was taking over at that time there was a big shift that was happening. And when there's a big shift, it's not a good time to try to explain to people that you want to come back from another country and, and work for a random month. So there's a period of time where I actually just worked at a local hospital nearby where I where I grew up at one point in Virginia and one point in West Virginia, just because it's on the state line there. So I also had babies in there. So one time I worked because I came in the same area because I came back and I had a baby and then I needed to work some shifts too. So I don't know. It's a, it's always, it's a little bit, I'm sure for everybody, there's a lot of juggling and a lot of variables. And so I will acknowledge that that's been a lot of my story. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing. Lacey or Monica, do y'all want to sort of share about your employer and the financial aspect of your work? Sure. Yeah, I can go. So I, 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 number one, 
if you, you asked Carly, if someone wanted to come work there, if someone wanted to come work on the island of St. Croix, we are definitely hiring emergency physicians. We have a major shortage of physicians all around and there are job opportunities. So definitely reach out after this and I'm happy to pass along information. But like I said, the benefit of, of living here and working here is yes, our, so our the hospital that I'm currently working in is the only hospital for the entire island of St. Croix. We're very limited in the subs that we have. And so we end up having to fly a lot of patients off the island to get them to either Puerto Rico or Miami. And so people end up spending sometimes days in the emergency department in order to make that happen. So it's a really unique place where you're kind of simultaneously practicing emergency medicine, but also some inpatient medicine and some critical care simultaneously. Our hospital was destroyed by hurricanes Irma and Maria. So we're practicing out of a trailer hospital that was built by FEMA. And so there's definitely things we don't have. And so I do have the challenges of kind of overseas work. But one of the huge benefits is I also make a salary that is very similar to what I was making when I was working in academic emergency medicine back in Charleston, South Carolina. So from a financial standpoint, that definitely makes it easier to kind of go back to the first question about balancing time. One of the things that was really frustrating for me in academic emergency medicine was that even with buy down, you use your buy down time like you talked about to do the administrative things to do the teaching. And so I felt like I was working constantly. And I think Kristen kind of alluded to this in order to then take time off so that I could go somewhere else and work some more. And so the upside of, of living in a place where I feel like I'm able to use my global emergency medicine training and still serve a population very much in need, but having that be my primary job and be in the place that I'm living is that when I finally do get days off, I actually have days off. And so that's been really, really nice. So I think, I guess, summarizing, you know, there are, there are lots of places that you can work and there's a lot of like rural places within the United States, whether it's in a U.S. territory overseas or in the United States mainland, where you can use a lot of the skills and enjoy the same aspects that I think a lot of us enjoy about being able to give through global emergency medicine without necessarily having to leave the country that you're from. Thanks, Lucy. Monica, will you share a little bit about sort of the, the MSF and travel portion of your, your time? Yeah. So I work, I, I get paid by Tulane. So, you know, I have, I'm 60, I think, I can't remember exactly what percentage I am, which basically just is a number of weeks. Um, so I'm 52% full-time. So I get paid that percentage of the full-time salary, but I get paid a salary. So I get paid year round, even if I'm not actually physically in the country. So that, that part is very useful because I also get health insurance and I, I picked to be 52% because I got health insurance. There was like a cutoff and, you know, if you work below, I think you don't, you don't get it. So you have to pay for it on your own. So I did so I, I do work 52%. And then when I work for MSF, you know, it's not for free. It's not volunteer job. So I receive a stipend, which is very minimal. No one's making money in MSF, but it was enough for me to pay off my minimum loans out of residency. So I joined MSF directly after residency. I just worked like a small locum's job while I was waiting for my first mission. Then I quit that job after I, after I got my first project. And I had quite a lot of loans that I just paid off two years ago. But I used my MSF money just to pay that because when you're actually in the project, your room, your board, all of your transportation, your food, everything is taken care of, which is the nice part about it. And, you know, like I said, it's not that much money, but it was enough for me to like maintain. I also, you know, I don't really have a, a very materialistic lifestyle, you know, like I have a really old car. I don't live in like a really fancy house. I don't own a house. I don't buy a lot of things. For me, like my priority is doing this. And so I've adjusted my lifestyle accordingly because that's important to me. And I do think that some people, once they finish residency, they immediately go buy a lot of stuff. I just didn't do it. I just started to make more money. So I was able to kind of pay off my loans and also not, you know, not worry for the times where I do work for NGOs that don't pay me that. So I, I have worked for other NGOs that don't have the same amount of resources. And that has a lot of resources. Other NGOs don't have those. And so you are responsible for at least your flight, sometimes even your room and board, depending on where you're going. And then if you have, if you maintain an apartment, like I have a place in New Orleans, I usually sublet it. And during COVID, that was a little bit more difficult, but otherwise I would sublet it just to cover my costs while I live in. But my salary at Tulane pays for that. Awesome. So we don't have a ton of time left, but if you wanted to maybe share your best piece of advice for how you have sort of figured out how to balance a geographically diverse career and maybe any step along the way that you thought was particularly critical or valuable to your success. Maybe I'll add something briefly. And it's not, it's really for those who are interested in doing this to some degree, it, 
And once you're once you're there, wherever there might be, flexibility is key. But different people are already nodding their heads on this, and like you'll have an agenda, you'll have a schedule, and you get over there, and things are totally flipped upside down. So you almost kind of need to expect that and and roll with it. You know what? You know, regardless of how it looks, I'm going to serve and I'm going to try to make a difference or I'm going to teach someone, I'm going to help someone. But flexibility is key. Question in the chat if anybody wants to tackle that briefly as well. One member in the group just asked for those working in academics, any any other tips on how to negotiate the value of global work to your employer to allow for a protected time? Yeah, I can. I, sorry. I was just going to really quickly say, you know, when I was in academics, the biggest thing for me was always figuring out what the department chair's goals were and then making sure somehow that I presented my decision desire for support in a way that wasn't necessarily reflective of exactly what I wanted, but figuring out how to put it in light of what was already fitting with what I knew their goals were. Yeah, I was going to say something along those lines, you know, certainly you're, you're, you're making an argument for something valuable to you that may not be intuitively valuable to somebody else who might have more of a finance kind of stance. So, so what, what things are valuable? What things are you bringing that are unique? that are your, you know, your abilities and how, you know, obviously you see that very clearly because it's your passion, but it may not be for somebody else. So identify what things might be valuable for the group. So something, you know, that, that may not make sense quite quite like it does to you as far as a global trip, but you might kind of phrase it as a value for kind of recognition for the hospital or residency involvement. Because of course, you know, recruiting residents to an academic place is hugely important and residents in general are interested in exploring these opportunities. So, so, you know, th those types of things make a difference to chairs and there's a whole different, you know, a whole lot of ways you can, you can kind of test that impact, but yeah, that's what I would do is, is really figure out what, what you bring to the table and clearly describe that. I think obviously mine's not in regards to the, the academics, but just rather kind of the takeaway point is, you know, I want to just say thanks for having this panel and to just say, like, I hope that you know, all of us were an example of the fact that, you know, don't be afraid to dream about it, you know, even if you haven't seen somebody doing exactly. I think somebody said, you know, before, like, figure out what it is that you really, really want, and then, and then work towards that. Because I think there's a lot of different, and I think that was the goal of this panel was to show that there's a lot of different ways that this can work out. And so figure out what it is that you're working towards. And don't, don't be afraid to believe that it can, that it can happen. Happen, whatever that looks like for you. You know, I was surprised how difficult it was to create my own structure after residency. I think no one really ever told me that you can then do what. Um, and I, I had some things that I wanted to do, but, you know, I, I think, you know, most people here are married or have children or have families, but like really do have quite a lot of freedom or you have a, a partner that's like very flexible and will come with you. You have to create your own structure and, and maybe it was naive, but I don't think I realized how many decisions had been made for me for so many years of my life because I'd been in, been in medical school and in residency. And even though I took many detours along the way, I encourage you to as well, but ultimately like I knew it's going. And then at the end of your residency, you, it's up to you can do whatever you want in reason. And in creating that structure, especially in a field where there's not a set structure, is, is really difficult. And it's why a lot of people don't do things that are global health because there's not a cookie cutter way to do it. And it is a lot of networking and just talking to people and looking at someone's career, seeing if they're happy and then just going for that. So I would say do that, you know, do more of this, talk to talk to people who have done it before and ask those questions about their personal life. Because, you know, I, I always ask women, kids, how do they do it? Because that was something that I always thought that I wanted and, you know, was, was kind of hesitant about how that could fit into a global health career. So, so look for those people and make sure they confirm and then ask them how they did it. My very supportive husband just got home and he's making fun of me for looking very serious. <laughs> Does anyone have other questions? You can unmute yourself and ask or put anything else in the chat. I do have a quick question. Hi, my name is Sally. I'm finishing up my third year here at UChicago. I've always been interested in emergency medicine, but I've kind of decided not to go the fellowship route. For those people who didn't do fellowship and are still doing kind of global health stuff, do you recommend doing any kind of like courses, diplomas that can help you get into that kind of like field and if you're interested in going back into academic medicine that could help you with that I'm kind of right now I'm going into community medicine but I want to keep those doors open right to be able to do global health and academic medicine at some point in the future so I think it kind of depends on what you want to do so you know if if your goal were to go into academics I think a lot of times having the fellowship training and also the relationships you make during fellowship really helps with that 
But I think since you're interested in community, the question you should be asking yourself is specifically, what do you want to do in global health? And then I would say the programs that I found helpful for actually working overseas were based on what I was going to be doing. So if you're going to be working somewhere where you need a lot of tropical medicine training, maybe doing one of the tropical medicine programs would be helpful. If you find you want to be working in like humanitarian response, you know, maybe doing one of like the programs through the ICRC, like the help course would be helpful to sort of give you the background you need. So I would say, you know, if your goal is just to get that extra training, I think you really need to ask what what you're going to be doing with it and then really focus it in. I think many teams would take you as a a team member for the shorter term trips to see if this is something you really want to do long term. So my Honduras trip is one week every January. We go to the same towns. I see the same people. I work with the same team down there, the same team of local physicians as well. And we would absolutely always take on a new a new person who's like kind of learning the ropes of is this something I want to do with my life? And like Lacey said, it really depends on what you want to do long-term if you need to do any extra training. A lot of times you don't just to work, but if you want to kind of make a career of it, it is helpful. Thank you. Maybe I'll be reaching out. Any other questions that you want to open up to the group or we've been able to share some of the emails in this recording from some of our panelists if you want to email offline or reach out offline. Okay, well, thank you all so much for joining. Lacey, Kristen, Ben, Monica, Monica, Brian, Carly, thank you all so much for being part of this and being amazing examples of sort of traditional and non-traditional careers. I think we're all pretty non-traditional being in global EM, global health in the first place, but thank you for sort of sharing your background and experience with everyone. Thank you, Katie. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Crystal, for helping coordinate.